nice to know that the Lord included us. If you have your Bible, uh, and I trust many of you do, we're, we're going to be turning to our reference text, and that's located in Deuteronomy chapter 18. So let's turn there. I was looking uh, this past week at a certain church service, and uh, I was amazed at, uh, at what I saw in the service, and, and that was, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a Baptist service, that's for sure, uh, but um, it was, a, actually it was a Lutheran service, and uh, I'm not going to tell you how many people were there, but at the end of the service, the, the pastor went, he, he did something like this, he said, uh, he said, go in peace, and he said, and the Lord be with you. Who? <laughs> and I said, okay, all right. That's a little different there. It's a little different, but uh, but but if you if you if you thought that was rather unique, you should have set in on the service, and you would have went. Oh, what a way to end uh, uh, unusual service, unusual service. So, Deuteronomy chapter eighteen. Uh, and our references is found in verse number 21 and 22. We're going to read these two references, and then I'm going to have you turn to Isaiah chapter 44. But here, um, of course, this has to do with uh, determining whether or not one is truly a prophet and just the litmus test for a prophet. And this was during the days of Moses, obviously. But in verse 21, the Bible says, And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Then he answers, he says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, this is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. You know, in a statement like that, obviously, one would think that perhaps there were people that were questioning Moses' um, authenticity of, of being a prophet. And, and, of course, God would have to give Moses the words to say to convince those that were listening whether or not he was truly God's man. I don't know if anyone in the Bible doesn't say uh, in Moses' day outside of, of people like Korah and and Nadab and Abihu that actually rose up against Moses, and we know that God dealt with that. But I don't know if there were any others that questioned whether or not Moses was, was truly God's man. Uh, since that was the last book of Deuteronomy, of course, that statement would, would carry on all the way up to today. Uh, if someone claims to be, and, and we don't have prophets today, and, and why don't we have prophets today? We don't have prophets because we have the written word of God. We have the Bible. Remember, they didn't have the Bible back then. Uh, they, they, God gave Moses the laws, but they didn't have the completed word of God. And so there's no need. But we have people today, uh, if you go to Pentecostal, some Pentecostal churches, they'll say, well, this is our prophet. And, and they'll use that terminology. And sometimes I, I call them on the rug. I say, well, uh, your prophet, you know, give us a prophecy and let's see if it comes to pass. And so, and, and then, of course, you'll know whether or not. Isaiah 44, I want you to look at verse number, the last verse, verse 28. Verse 28, and, and then we're going to look at the first verse in, in Isaiah 45. So, Isaiah 44, 28, the Bible says, Thus saith Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and the temple, thy formation shall be laid. Thy foundation shall be laid. In verse number 1, chapter 45, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word, and, and what a privilege it is to open the Bible and, 
and once again uh, dive into our study concerning Bible prophecy. We, we understand, uh, Lord, the, the need in our day to answer questions concerning uh, what lies ahead of, of, uh, for us as a nation. And, and, and yea, Lord, even beyond that time frame, we thank you, God, that we have your word to give us clarity, to give us confidence, uh, God, so that as we see things start to unfold, our, our faith is, is secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. Now help me over the next few minutes or so uh, to uh, encourage your people and, and show them, Lord, just some of the various prophecies that have come to pass, uh, Lord, as, as we transition to other foundational prophecies uh, leading us all the way into the millennial reign of, of Christ and, and beyond that. We love you and we thank you for this time that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, if, if you were with us, of course, you recall how we, we started a brand new series of, of messages involving Bible prophecy. And in, in that particular study, we, we talked about um, Bible prophecy from the, the standpoint of, of, of how prophecy can, can best benefit us as Christians. Three things that I mentioned, and, and just for sake of review, I want to mention those three things in which prophecy will do. Number one, we said that obviously Bible prophecy is educational. We, we know that when we, we do various studies on Bible prophecy, God's people learn so much. I remember when I first got saved, uh, one of the fascinating things to me concerning my faith was, was uh, reading the Bible and, and trying to understand prophecy and those things. I can remember, uh, I don't know if you were like me, but when I first got saved, immediately I ran to the book of Revelation. How many of you, is that what happened to you? Okay, I know for me that's what I did. And I was, I was, I was excited, but I was very confused, amen? And, and thank God for movies like The Thief in the Night, amen? <laughs> that, that series, right? Not, not the uh, one with John Jenkins, that came out. That was, uh, what was, I can't remember that, but I'm talking about the thief in the night, you know, prodigal planet and all of that. That was out back in the 70s and, and, and all of that. Uh, but, but um, you know, I started to, to become uh, schooled, if you will, concerning uh, Bible prophecy later on. And so we know prophecy is educational. I mentioned last week that it's also confrontational. Uh, some people will, will disregard prophecy, and, and one of the biggest reasons why is because of fear. Uh, they, not too many people are, are looking toward the future because uh, they, they don't want to be alarmed. They don't want to be shaken. And, 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 uh, but can I say this to you? You turn on your nightly news, you're going to be shaken, right? I mean, there are things that are happening in real time that, that – that really uh, has the, the capability of, of causing people to be put in a situation where they don't even want to leave their, their homes. And so, uh, but, but there's going to be some confrontation. You're going you're gonna to find out as you share what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks with people uh, who perhaps their church don't even talk about Bible prophecy. Some people will become confrontational. And then I mentioned how that it's also inspirational. And of course, for me, when I first got saved, as I said, even though I was not able to understand certain prophecy, I mean, there's some basic prophecy in the Bible that you can understand, but, but I, it, it, it built my faith. It, it made me a little bit more secure in my belief. And, and perhaps that is one of the reasons why I am still serving the king today, because a Bible prophecy. And so we mentioned that uh, Bible prophecy, obviously it, 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 it involves those three areas, but we also talked about how Bible prophecy is divided into three groups. And those three groups were prophecy past and, and, uh, and prophecy present. And, and then, of course, we're going to be seeing some prophecy future as we move further on. But, but for, for this study... Uh, and, and for because we're at the very ground level of prophecy, we're, we're going to look at some of the, the prophecy that was passed. Okay? Um, 
Last week, moving into our, our study, we began to view various passages involving prophecy that was not only declared, but prophecy that obviously was fulfilled. And here, even as we, we, we jump back into our lesson from last week, in Isaiah chapter 44, you'll notice how the prophet here is, is speaking. And, and he gives us a prophecy concerning a man by the name of Cyrus. Uh, you know, I thought this was interesting, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why here shortly, but even still on Wednesday nights, we are, we are going through the book of Esther. And if you, if you know anything about the book of Esther, we're talking about King Ahasuerus and Esther and Haman and, and those things. But uh, one, of the, one of the key figures that's not mentioned on, on a continual basis in the book of Esther is Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus was the actual king over the, over the Persians. And then King Ahasuerus, of course, came after Cyrus. But here in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, it says, Thus saith, or thus, or, or that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built. And the temple and or the foundation shall be laid. Now, in making a statement like that, we know that even today, of course, and even after this, remember, in Esther's day, the temple had been leveled because of the Babylonians. But then you had people come on the scene such as uh, Nehemiah, you had people like uh, Haggai and, and, and others, prophets, that appeared after the Babylonians, and they would be used to rebuild the temple. They also would be, uh, be used to rebuild the altar and those things. And so that prophecy came to pass. And in verse 44, he says, Thus saith, or verse number one of chapter 45, he says, thus saith the Lord uh, 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 to his anointed, to Cyrus. Here we see God is, gonna, is using this king so that he might be the tool that will be instrumental in bringing back the nation of Israel to the place of worship. Now look at verse 13 in chapter 45. We didn't read that verse, but he says this, I have raised him up. That is, God had raised up Cyrus in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, this is interesting. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Now, chapter 36 is the last book or the last chapter in the book of 2 Chronicles. And, um, but it's, it's interesting because, you know, the prophet Isaiah foretold how that this man Cyrus would do what? He would conquer uh, uh, the Babylonians. He would conquer Nebuchadnezzar and... Uh, and he would destroy that impregnable wall of the Babylonians. And um, he also indicated that, that this man Cyrus would become a world power during his lifetime. And in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, look at the last two verses. And, and, and the book of Chronicle, the book of Chronicles. It, it, um, it chronicalizes, if you will, the kings of Israel. And so at the end of the book of Chronicles, and then, of course, the next book is the book of Ezra, you move into a different time frame, which follows after all the kings have been done away with. Either they, they died or, or they went into captivity. The nation had gone into captivity. And at this point, Israel is... is under the, the leadership 
of Cyrus. Look at verse number 22. He says, now the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, this is the first year. Remember, Persia now is a world power, and this is their very first leader. He says this, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah, and who is Jeremiah was a contemporary to Isaiah. Jeremiah and Isaiah, they were around during the same time frame. He said that it might be fulfilled or might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of King of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying, thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth had the Lord God of heaven given me. Now, he's a world power. Remember, prior to him was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And he says this, uh, and house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people? The Lord, his God, be with him and let him go up. Let him go up where? And he's, he's talking now, concerning the nation of Israel. He said, who is it that's among you? Let him go up and do what? Let him go up and rebuild the temple and, and rebuild the, the wall, if you will, of Jerusalem. Now, Isaiah, as we read in chapter 44, in the first verse in chapter 45, verse 1, as well as, as verse 13, Isaiah made this statement that Cyrus was going to come and that he would be king. It was prophesied 150 years before Cyrus was even born. And I find that fascinating. Isaiah prophesied, and he even gives us his name. He says his name is Cyrus, 150 years before he was born. And he also, of course, said uh, in 180 years, uh, Cyrus, of course, would, would perform this after that. And, and 80 years before the Jews, he made that prophecy 80 years before the Jews actually went into Persia. Okay, that prophecy came out uh, that they would do that. And so that's, that's fascinating. And, and what are we looking at? We're looking at some prophecies here that, that makes the Bible the word of God. Uh, you know, one day you and I are going to leave the scene. And what's going to happen? This book is still going to be active. Things are still going to be happening. And, and they're going to be in tandem with the word of God, with that book that you're holding in your hand. Okay? Let me give you another one. Um, Joshua prophesied that, turn, turn to Joshua chapter 6. Oh, this is a good one here. Joshua chapter 6. Now you'll bear with me real quickly. Amen. As I, as I turn there as well. Uh, Joshua chapter 6. Joshua made a prophecy. He, he said that um, he said that Jericho, and you remember what happened with Jericho. They marched around the walls of Jericho, and the walls fell flat. Okay? And, and Jericho was destroyed. Was destroyed. Now, but Joshua made a prophecy. Joshua said that Jericho would be rebuilt. And, and he also said, now, now this is interesting. Look at chapter 6. I, I'd like to have somebody read verse number 26. Anybody? Verse, or Brother Nick. Now, now, Joshua there, as you could tell, he says, he says, cursed be the man that will attempt to rebuild Jericho. OK, and, and then he made this statement. He said that the individual who builds this, he said, is going to be built in his eldest son. And then he said it's going to be built in his youngest son. Now, that's a that's an interesting statement. What did what did he mean by that? Joshua here, obviously, of course. As he makes this, this prophecy, um, about five centuries later, 500 years later, 
this prophecy found its fulfillment. And it was fulfilled just like Joshua said. Now, 500 years, Joshua's long gone. And, um, but I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. By the way, you'll never hear me make a prophecy. Amen. No, sir. I, I, don't, I don't want to give anybody a, a chance to say, preacher, you said this, that, and the other. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't hear that from me. Um, uh, 1 Kings chapter 16. And uh, I want you to look at verse number 33 and 34. Now, I want somebody to read those two verses. Brother Terrence. Okay, now, now you'll notice here, and, and you'll have to excuse Brother Terrence, he, he read like a freight train, amen? I mean, just shoom, right? And, uh, but, uh, so you had to listen real quick, right? Uh, but, uh, but you'll notice here in, in this statement, he said uh, that, uh, and by the way, who is king now? Ahab is the king. And, and of course, Ahab was one of the most wicked kings that Israel had, man. His we know his his wife was that Jezebel, and uh, uh, but but here it, it says um, in in his day, and it gives us this this Heel in, in verse number thirty four. In the days of Heel the Beth Bethlehem, he built Jericho, and then it says that he laid the foundation thereof according to Abiram his firstborn. Now what is that about? And history has proven this. When, when, when this, this man sought to rebuild Jericho, his, his son was working, and what ended up happening, his son died and was buried in the midst of the, the building trying to build this or rebuild Jericho. And his body is in the ruins or, or in, the, in the foundation of when they sought to build Jericho. But it, that was the firstborn. Of, of Hiel. But then as the work continued and they started to put the gate up, his youngest son died as well in the midst of putting the gate up. And you, you'll notice here, he says, and set up the gate thereof in his youngest son. And, and where did all of this come from? This, this was prophesied 500 years before it actually happened. But it, it happened exactly the way Joshua called it. Amen. And it's, it's just amazing how, how the Bible itself is it's, it's so accurate. It's very minute. It, it just it, it does what it says. It says what it does. No one could uh, complete such an extensive study of Scripture without coming to the same definite conclusion that we have uh, in, in the Bible. And that is that the Bible it's the word of God. The Bible is God's prophetic, prophetic book, prophetic book. Now, uh, but, you know, that's to be expected among us who are Christians. You know, when we read the Bible, typically we don't doubt what the word of God has to say. We, we typically believe it is God's word, the Bible, the word of God. And so, and so from, from that standpoint, uh, and, and, we, we got to look at a couple of these. We've looked primarily in the Old Testament uh, concerning some Bible prophecy. But, but as, we, as we look in the New Testament, you know, the New Testament pinpoints various references concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. There are over 300 prophecies, over 300 prophecies, passages concerning the Savior and why is this? It's because Jesus Christ is the candlestick of all prophecy. I mean, he's the one to which all prophecy literally points to, 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 the, to his coming, to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, so for the next 
12 minutes or so, let's, let's look at a couple of, uh, of uh, prophecies concerning uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I want you to, since we're in the Old Testament, turn to this foundational text, the book of Micah. Okay, we want to turn there to the book of, of Micah. Okay. okay, Micah is one of the minor prophets. Okay, all right. And um, if you if you go to Nahum, you've gone too far. If you go to to Jonah, it's after the book of Jonah. And uh, and and in this particular prophecy, it tells us where it tells us seven hundred years before not only Jesus would be born. But it tells us where he would be born. It tells us where he would be born. So, uh, and turn to chapter 5, uh, Micah chapter 5. And uh, uh, what I'd like to do is have somebody read verse, verse number 2. Verse number 2. Anybody want to take a chance to, of reading that? All right. Uh, brother, uh, brother, uh, brother Hall. Brother Hall, Brother Hall. Amen. Amen. Now, as I indicated, this prophecy was, was actually spoken by Micah uh, approximately 700 to 800 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, this prophet, he lived, Micah lived during the same time as Hosea, same time as Amos, and the same time even as Isaiah. So he was around during that same time frame, which is interesting. Now, uh, was this prophecy fulfilled? Yes, it, it was fulfilled. Uh, and, and for the sake of time, I'm going to read this in John chapter 7, uh, verse number 42 and 43. Uh, the Bible says this. It says, uh, Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where Christ was? So there was division among the people because of him because of him. Now, now that, was, that was a different reference. The reference we usually go to is uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. Uh, that's a historical reference concerning Christ. Or Luke chapter 2, verse 4, 5, and 17. But here in John, John says that, of course, uh, had not the scripture said. And, of course, when John said that, he was referring to the Old Testament. Okay? And he said that, of course, Christ would come of the seed of David, and uh, which obviously uh, is out of the, the line of Judah, and uh, would come out of the town of Bethlehem, which, as Micah said here uh, in his reference, uh, here he talks about uh, Bethlehem, Euphrates, and, and so how true that is. But one of the fascinating references that I like concerning Christ is his virgin birth. I mean, the probability of something like that happening. You know, how is it that a woman can give birth to a child with, with, without, you know, any, any man, any uh, seed provided that way? But we know that that was true uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to turn with me to, let's go to the New Testament. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. And, and while you're turning there to Matthew chapter 1, um, I'm going to read the reference of how it was foretold that Christ uh, would be born of a virgin while you're turning there. And that obviously is found in the famous Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. If that's actually the reference that we often use around Christmas time, right? Uh, but, but it says there in, in Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which obviously interpreted meaning uh, God with us, God be with us. So here in Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 
number 21 through 23. Verse 21 through 23. Anybody want to take a chance at, at read, take a shot at that? All right. Brother Juan. Amen. Amen. And and now how long how long was it when, when that prophecy was first mentioned? It was over 700 years ago uh, that it was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 714 that this would happen. You know, 700 years and then it happened and it happened minutely. It happened the way he said it would happen. A virgin would conceive. Now, there are some other references here. Let me give you concerning his temptation. It was prophesied that he would be tempted. And that's, that's found over in Psalm 91, verse number 11 through 12, 11 and 12. And it was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. That's when he was tempted of the devil, went into the wilderness 40 days. Satan tempted him in three areas. Then there's another one here, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Zechariah prophesied in Zechariah 9.9. 9. And, and, and who was Zechariah? Zechariah came from a priestly family. He came from a family of priests in the Old Testament. Zechariah was a visionary with the prophet Haggai. And of course, both Zechariah and Haggai would be used instrumentally, if you will, in rebuilding the temple. And why is that? Because Zechariah was a prophet, and God would use him and Haggai to rebuild the temple as well as other prophets. And so, uh, but the New Testament gospel, and you may not know this, the New Testament gospel quotes more of Zechariah than any other prophet, even more than Isaiah, which I thought was interesting, amen? So the New Testament quotes much of, of uh, out of the book of Zechariah. And could it be uh, because Zechariah would be the one that said when Jesus comes or when he comes, he's going he's gonna to split the eastern sky. And it says that, that he's going to, it tells you, he tells you that he's going to walk through a certain uh, location in Jerusalem. And that's part of the prophecy that we'll be looking at uh, in weeks to come. But uh, so his triumphant entry in Jerusalem uh, was prophesied by Zechariah and Zechariah 9, 9, and it was fulfilled in, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 8 through 11. That's when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, if you remember that, and they, they cast down these uh, uh, palm branches and, 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 and sung to him. And, uh, but it was also prophesied that the Lord Jesus Christ would be rejected. And, and I want you to turn, I want you to go to Isaiah uh, chapter 53. You know, when, whenever you, you, you talk about Bible prophecy, you cannot exclude his virgin birth and you cannot exclude his, res his crucifixion. You, you know, it, you just can't do that. Um, and, and, and his rejection. And, and I'm going to read this, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, look at verse number one through three. The Bible says, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Can I say this today, even right now at this very moment, many people don't believe our report. They don't believe what we have to say about Jesus. They still reject him. They still deny him. I'm going to, I'm going to preach a sermon tonight uh, it's, it's going to be a rambunctious sermon. I just want to give you a heads up. Uh, uh, but uh, but it's part of the problem is because the world still rejects Jesus Christ. And uh, and it says here, he says, uh, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It's, it's revealed to those of us who know him and those who respond to the gospel. For he shall grow up before him 
as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Now, this, this is a picture of Israel. This is a picture of the nation of Israel. And then it says, and now it talks about his appearance. It, you know, it, and now we, we talk about, of course, Jesus would grow up, if you will, as a tender plant out of a dry ground, Israel being that dry ground, and now gives us some of his description, uh, Jesus' description. He had no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And of course, we, we have to understand there's a twofold statement mentioned in that passage. Not only, of course, was Jesus not a handsome figure, he was not like a, I don't know who, you know, I, I'm just trying to think, you know, um, Brad Pitt, I guess, you know, uh, I don't know, Pastor Mick Miller, I don't know, you know, so, uh, uh, but no, <laughs> but, but uh, definitely not Pastor Mick Miller, amen, <laughs> uh, but, but he, his appearance was not such that people were attracted to him, and then, of course, the second phase, or the second part, when he hung on the cross, uh, and they beat him to a bloody pulp. Nobody desired him. Okay, it says no beauty that he should be desired. And then in verse number three, there it is. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquaintance with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now this, of course, this is, a, this is a prophecy concerning his rejection and how no one would want to have anything to do with him. And of course, time will not allow us to go through it, but this prophecy was fulfilled in John chapter 1, verse number 10 and 11, which actually reads this way. It says, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. And so this is just, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a prophetic uh, 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 rendition of what would happen to Jesus when he came. You know, and, and this, again, this prophecy was mentioned over 700 years before he came, before he came. And so, and, and there is much more, obviously, and, and we're not, we can talk about his betrayal, 30 pieces of silver, that was prophesied, of course, his death, his crucifixion, and how that his hands would be pierced, his feet would be pierced. That's mentioned uh, how he was, and I thought this one was fascinating, how he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. And, and I mean, that's in Isaiah 53, verse 9, 53, uh, verse 9. Uh, you, you know, how, how, I mean, the probability of that happening, being buried in a rich man's tomb when the world rejected him, you know, how could that happen? You would think if he's, if anything, if he's buried, he's going to be buried in a poor man's tomb. Or he's going to be buried uh, uh, without, you know, he's going to be buried in the street somewhere. But it was prophesied how, of course, he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. And, uh, but, but let me, let me close with this. Uh, mathematically speaking, oh, and, and then there's that final prophecy uh, that he would be raised from the dead. Uh, in Psalm 1610. Mathematically speaking, one person fulfilling eight prophecies, they say this, this is what mathematicians have said, one person fulfilling eight prophecies is, is like one to, to, to one six trillion. One six trillion. Now, now that's, that's a bunch of O's after one, amen? A bunch of zeros after one. Okay. If eight prophecies were to be fulfilled, um, if 48 prophecies were to be fulfilled, they say that it would be 10 to the 157th power in order for 48 prophecies to be fulfilled. Can I say this to you? In Jesus, there were 300 plus prophecies fulfilled. And, I, and you know, that's where the mathematician stopped. They, they, they couldn't go beyond that, okay? Amen. So, so is, is the Bible the Word of God? Yes, Amen. it's the Amen. Word of God. Amen. And there are tons of Scripture uh, to, to, to prove that. History is on our side concerning whether or not uh, the Bible is the Word of God. Next week, um, we're going we're gonna to get into 
uh, the next, uh, the, the prophecy uh, after, if you will, uh, you know, just some of the, the prophecy. We're going to start to transition to the rapture of the church. I'm going to be talking about that. We're going to make some comments leading up to that, but we're going to talk about the rapture of the church, and we're going to get into more details concerning Bible prophecy. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the reading of your word. Uh, Father, what a, what a tremendous book that we hold in our hand. Uh, it's the word of God. Uh, people have, have died for it. Uh, kingdoms uh, have been built off of it. Uh, the United States was built off of it, Lord, in, 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 the, in, in the early stages of our development. Lord, we thank you that we have documents to prove that. Uh, but Lord, uh, more than that, this is, this is your love letter to us. Amen. God, help us to cherish it. Help us to read it. Help us, God, to learn it. God, help us to apply it in our lives. Be with our services this morning. Speak to hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name.